This is A View from the Bunker. Now, here's Derek Gilbert. You've heard of the uh, universe and the multiverse. What about the Bible verse? It's a clever turn of phrase that applies to a conference coming to Cincinnati later this year. Welcome to A View from the Bunker. I'm Derek Gilbert. Joining me, gentleman who is a part of this gathering and also a uh, man who's got a very interesting resume. Retired U.S. Marine, served three tours in Iraq, one in Afghanistan as a Marine and as a contractor for the DOD. A former state legislator in Tennessee and the author of several books with very interesting titles, Ancient Cities and the Gods Who Built Them, The Earth As It Was, Secret Societies, Blood Never Sleeps, and he's the host of Marginal Mysteries, a program for Southwest Radio Ministries and uh, one of the featured speakers at the Mysteries of the Bible Verse Conference in Cincinnati, June 7th and 8th. We welcome Micah Van Hus to the program for the first time. Micah, thank you for joining us. Derek, it's awesome to be here. I appreciate you having me on the bunker. It, uh, and by the way, for viewers who are watching and saying, this doesn't look like the usual set, it's not. I'm in the house tonight trying to keep an eye on the, the dogs, which is not working as well as we would have hoped. So if you hear some noise in the background, that's what's going on here. Uh, but uh, if you're a dog lover, you know, you understand. Uh, Micah, uh, <laughs> I, I will say this, in, in looking you up on the web, it appears that the, uh, the media in Tennessee likes you about as well as they like us. <laughs> well, I worked very hard to ensure that uh, the media in Tennessee liked me. <laughs> <laughs> He's trying to bring God back into the statehouse. We can't have that. <laughs> uh, no, no. Uh, ancient cities and the gods who built them. Uh, what what led you down this path of research, and uh, what kind of what conclusions did you reach? Well, so it uh, it goes back decades, uh, at least two decades. Uh, my brother showed me Genesis chapter six, where God chose Noah because he was perfect in his generations. Now, I've grown up in church, uh, and saved at the age of seven, graduated from Pensacola Christian College, and um, I guess I was early twenties. My brother showed me Genesis six, where it says that Noah was perfect in his generations. And from that moment on, uh, I read every book I could, started watching all YouTube videos I could on uh, on the topic. I think the first book I read when I learned that was, uh, let's see, The Nephilim and the Pyramid of the Apocalypse, I think was the very first book. But I just right. I just haven't haven't stopped reading books and studying about it. And it's just, it's an awesome topic to study. Yeah, we interviewed Patrick Heron back in the day and uh, came to be friends and sadly never got to meet him face to face. But uh uh, we, we were looking forward to uh, that, that time in heaven for uh, the opportunity to take him up on a song and a Guinness uh, when, we, uh, when we all get together in glory. Uh, yeah. that, that is a uh, kind of eye-opening when you look at his, his take on the, um, the pyramid of the apocalypse being a cube, or being a pyramid rather than a cube, which is what uh, a lot of us sort of uh, imagine based on the dimensions given in the book of Revelation. Um, but uh, mm -hmm. the ancient cities and the gods who built them, again, this is kind of a thing that uh, a lot of Christians struggle with, that word G-O-D. We assume it only applies to one entity in, the, in all of creation. So when you start using that word in the plural, uh, some people start getting a little, a little nervous. Well, uh, those nervous folks, if they're Christians, uh, go ahead and read Psalm chapter 82. Uh, this is the council of the gods in scripture. King James, Elohim, sits among the gods. God sits among the gods. Uh, and uh, so it should be if Christians believe their Bible, which they should. I believe the Bible is the inspired word of God. Uh, all 66 books that we have. Uh, I think the other books, which we study a lot, such as Enoch, Jasher, I, th I don't think they're inspired. But I do think that they uh, have a lot to bring to the table when it comes to what is going on that the Bible doesn't necessarily give us all the information on. So uh, as far as talking about gods, check out Psalm 82. Um, God is sitting among the council of the gods, which we're going to get into, I'm sure. Mm. So how do we how do we explain that then to people who are new to this concept that the idea of uh, multiple gods uh, in the uh, in the unseen realm is not polytheism? So well, I mean you don't you don't worship those gods. Um, we we worship God Almighty Elohim and the quote unquote gods. They're they're mainly gods in the mythologies, uh, Egyptian mythology, Greek mythology. Um, but really, when we're talking about gods, we're talking about angels. Um, we're talking about uh, uh, from the secular world, from mythology, we're talking about fallen angels, um, Lucifer, um, Gadriel, um, Shimyaza uh, from the Book of Enoch. Uh, so so just because they are called lowercase gods doesn't mean that we or I definitely do not uh, see them as um, my God at all. But we get the Philistines with their God Dagon. 
Um, we'll get into Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 7, 8, and 9, uh, where God divides the nation and the, the world into 70 nations. Um, so, yeah, you can call them gods. I would call them fallen angels uh, or angels because um, there is only one God. Uh, that is Jesus Christ, God the Father, God the Holy Spirit. So the uh, the Hebrew prophets then would have understood the world this way, that there were other small g gods worshipped by their pagan neighbors, the Philistines, the Canaanites, the Moabites, etc. They, they all had their mm -hmm. patron deities. Oh, yeah. And uh, the Hebrew prophets would have understood that these were real entities. Absolutely. And Solomon, uh, along with other kings, even worshipped uh, some of these deities. Uh, they're supposed to be followers of Yahweh, uh, but they end up uh, worshiping these deities and, and in Solomon's case, probably even sacrificing uh, to these, or at least letting his wives sacrifice to these gods, um, making idols to these gods. So um, yeah, absolutely. It's, uh, it's entwined throughout scripture and entwined throughout history. And in fact, uh, when you start to uh, conceive of what's going on with the gods and their offspring, the Nephilim, the giants, um, it actually makes a lot of sense. In fact, once you understand the topic, you'll start finding more references in scripture that are actually referring to these giants or these gods. And you're like Daniel chapter 10, we talk about the prince of Persia, prince of Greece, Daniel chapter 12, Michael, the prince of Israel. You start to understand really what's going on when you read scripture and see these portions of scripture. And uh, references to uh, the Rephaim that are uh, kind of concealed uh, mm -hmm. because the word is translated as the dead or the departed or the shades and things like that. Um, I'm interested about the cities, though, the ancient cities and the gods who built them. Uh, are, are you talking about cities that were literally built by these fallen angels? Uh, definitely uh, ruled by them. Now, when I'm talking about the gods who built them, it's uh, it's a little bit along the lines of the Nephilim and the Pyramid of the Apocalypse, mm -hmm. uh, the kind of theory that the uh, mm -hmm. pyramids are too advanced, the mathematics involved are too advanced uh, for humankind to have built them. Um, when it comes to a lot of these ancient sites, uh, what we see is, I, I don't know, I don't, I would guess that the Egyptians did not build the pyramids. What we see a lot of at Giza is much more advanced, much better walls, much better structures. And then on top of those structures, you'll see much uh, less uh, craftsmanship in the building of those structures because the Egyptians came along, either conquered a nation or just came along after the nation was gone and built on top. So it gets into the idea that um, a lot of these ancient uh, technologies could not have been just mankind, and that would lead us into the knowledge of the Watchers, found in the Book of Enoch, uh, very uh, subtly hinted at in Genesis. Um, the knowledge of the Watchers, I believe, is mentioned in Revelation chapter 21, verse 17. Uh, we talked a little bit about the man measuring heaven, Revelation 21, 17. Uh, he's using the cubit, and Revelation 21, 17 says that is the measure of the angel. So mm. I believe that Revelation chapter 21, 17 is saying that the angels taught the cubit to mankind. Now, that's the only reference in scripture, inspired scripture, that I can find referencing knowledge that angels taught to man. But, of course, the book of Enoch talks about all kinds of knowledge. You go to Enoch chapter 69, writing and abortion, uh, something that Penume taught to humankind. And you get earlier in the book of Enoch where they taught makeup, weapons, astronomy, astrology, mixing of roots, making, mixing of herbs. So I'm kind of I'm trying to hint at the edges without deep diving into any topic until you until you ask me to go there. But but we're kind of hitting around this a lot. So let's let's kick it off with the watchers. So Genesis chapter six, the inspired word of God says, uh, verse one and verse four, uh, the sons of God came into the daughters of men and had children with them. Uh, what this is, is these are angels who have decided to rebel against Elohim, took on earthly bodies, slept with women. And the giants that we find throughout scripture are their offspring, Genesis six, four. And there were giants in the earth in those days after the sons of God came to the daughters of men. Um, and so that's generally what Genesis says. Then we go to the book of Enoch, which is not inspired. It's an apocryphal book. Um, I believe it's got a lot of correct history. It says that, uh, that, that, that is what they did. They rebelled against Elohim, came down on Mount Hermon. Uh, the name Mount Hermon is the name of the curse. Um, and then they taught all kinds of forbidden knowledge to mankind. The giants, uh, well, what I'm going to summarize this up really quick in the book of Enoch because I don't think it's inspired, but inspired scripture goes and backs up what the book of Enoch says in many places, Old Testament and New. So for one, the book of Enoch says that when mankind could no longer satiate the giants, the giants began to eat mankind and drink their blood. We find that in scripture, the giants cannibalizing man. And that is when the tw when the spies go, they give an evil report of the land. Is that First Samuel? Off the top of my head, I don't remember. They give an evil report of the land. They say the land is, a, is filled with the people who eat the inhabitants thereof. They are the sons of Anak. 
So basically it's saying that the giants are eating the people in the land. Now, uh, what happens in order to tie this into scripture, and there's a lot of scripture that backs this up. So in order to do that, I need to finish the story a little bit. So what happens is uh, God sees what's going on on the earth that the watchers and Nephilim have corrupted. Let's separate watchers are the fallen angels and Nephilim are their offspring, half human, half angel, um, and fully physical. Um, so God sends four archangels. Gabriel, he tells to go cause the giants to war against each other and kill each other off before the flood. Uh, he tells Raphael and Michael to bind Shemyaza and bind Azazel and cast them into the abyss, into the prison. It names a prison, but it's it, it names a desert, but it's a po an antediluvian desert. So, you know, it's probably not still in the same place or uh, let's see. And Uriel, he tells Uriel to go warn Noah of the flood. So, but what's important here is that Raphael and Michael bind Shemyaza and Azazel in the pit, in the valleys of the earth, in chains until the great day of judgment for 70 generations. We find these angels in the pit, in the prison, in chains all throughout scripture. The book of Isaiah, it prophesies that the Messiah will go and visit these spirits. Well, let's go to 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 18, 19, and 20. Jesus, and this is scripture inspired, Jesus dies on the cross in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 18. It says he's in his uh, flesh, not in his, he's in his spirit form, not his flesh. The next verse says he goes down into the pit, into the prison, and the next verse says he ministers to the spirits that made trouble in the days of Noah. Well, minister is not the great translate, best translation, more like proclaimed his victory. After Jesus right, died on the cross, right. he goes down into the abyss, into Tartarus, and he proclaims his victory to the spirits that made trouble in the days of Noah. This is backed up in Jude 1, six. the angels which kept not their first estate, uh, but he hath reserved an everlasting chains under darkness. Second Peter chapter 2, um, there's a number of places in scripture that actually back up what the book of Enoch is talking about. So fascinating topic. Absolutely. Um, and I, I've even suggested that Ezekiel 32 may point to that with uh, uh, reference to uh, Asher or the Assyrian, except the Hebrew does not contain the definite article the in that phrase, Asher in the far reaches of the pit, which may hint at uh, that same entity just under a different name in what would be the Hebrew conception of, uh, of Tartarus, which is the word that Peter uses in 2 Peter 2, verse 4, translated hell in our Bible, but in the Greek, it's Tartarosis. So um, yeah, we're, we're the, the pieces fit together. And it's clear when you read the writings of the early church fathers that they understood that these um, gods worshiped by their pagan neighbors were just the fallen angels from the Hebrew scriptures. And when you read the, uh, the Septuagint translation, it's clear that Jewish religious scholars of the time of Jesus and the apostles understood that as well. So um, mm -hmm. it, it's, it's kind of surprising in a way that we've kind of lost that over the last 1900 years or so, mm -hmm. but surprising only if we assume that the enemy's not going to try to get in and subvert and corrupt the teachings that we've received over the years. Uh, and of course, with the enlightenment and uh, the scientific worldview that has taken over Western civilization, we tend to look at everything as though there's a scientific mm -hmm. explanation for it. Yeah. Um, the, uh, how, how did you get drawn into uh, this as a, a way of teaching? I mean, I, you host the program Marginal Mysteries for <laughs> Southwest Radio Ministries. Um, and and the, the title of the program, Marginal Mysteries, what, what did, how did that title come to be? So uh, Dr. Larry Spargimino, Noah Hutchins, and another gentleman, they wrote a book for Southwest called Marginal Mysteries. Um, and how I got into it, I've been working with Southwest for almost two years now. I've been on the circuit of speaking for three years now um, since I wrote Ancient Cities. How I got into this is Matthew Hill is the CEO of Southwest Radio Ministries, and he was a state representative uh, with me in Nashville. We both represented <laughs> Washington County. Uh, he represented one half and I represented the other half. And we've been friends since the third grade. So uh, on our four hour drive to Nashville and our four hour drive back, uh, sometimes we ride together. Sometimes we didn't. I would regale Matthew uh, and his brother, Timothy, who was a representative at the same time. I would regale them of the things I had learned about the giants and the different mysteries. And so Matthew, naturally, when he became uh, CEO of Southwest, he said, hey, we need to do this. And so uh, I came on board with Southwest Radio Ministries. God has blessed me. Um, I, I was, uh, I believe I was in his will. I wasn't running from God, but uh, I was working in politics after I was a uh, Dumbia state representative. Uh, but then God led me into this and I, he is richly blessed since I have been working with Southwest. And so I do believe that this is where God has me. Um, it's uh, interesting to say to some people that 
you know, you shouldn't be talking about giants and all the angels and all this. And I said, well, I believe God's called me to do this. So, um, but no, it's, this is the best job other than Iraq. This is the best job I've ever had. <laughs> um, I had the, uh, the honor of interviewing Noah Hutchings toward the end of his uh, life back, uh, oh, 13 years ago now at one of the uh, early Branson um, future Congress conferences put together by Tom Horn and um, Larry Spargimino has become a, a friend. Um, and what's really remarkable is, is looking at men like Larry and Noah, um, Gary Stearman at uh, Prophecy Watchers, mm -hmm. uh, the late Dr. Tom Horn, uh, mm -hmm. Dr. Michael Heiser, the late uh, Dr. Heiser, who are conservative uh, theologically, but who are very open to these types of topics and discussions uh, because... Mm -hmm. By by opening the door to these discussions, uh, a lot of mainline Christians will just say, "Well, you guys are fringe. You guys are wacky." Mm -hmm. <laughs> when when in fact, uh, I, I mean, how, how do you respond to that? How, what what is your reaction? How do you That's... Um, explain this to somebody who may have been a churchgoer all their lives and never heard Genesis six? I say it's fine. If, if they don't want to believe it, that's fine. Now, I was in politics, so I, I guess I know how to say that. But, it, you know, I can understand if people don't want to study this, that's fine. I, I don't I'm not going to fault them. I'm not going to talk bad about them. You know, people do what they want to do. For instance, I really don't want to get into demonology. That's not something I want to get into. Now, uh, if you know uh, Greg Patton, he was a pastor who was thrown into it because when you're a pastor and you have a demon possessed fa a family with a demon possessed daughter and they come to you for help. I mean, you're going to try to help them. People don't seek out – well, most people don't seek out demonology, and it's not something I want to do, and I don't feel that God's called me to do that at the moment. If he does, I'm going to do what God tells me. So it's similar to that. If people don't want to get into the giants and get into all that, hey, people do whatever they want. Now, from my perspective, Jesus said, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be at the coming of the Son of Man. He says his return comes as a thief in the night uh, and to be ready for it. And so uh, I think if God chose to include certain topics in the Bible, uh, then they are worthy of study. Um, and I will go back to Psalm chapter 82, uh, even including Revelation, in my opinion, Psalm 82. Well, when I first read it, it was the most mysterious portion of Scripture, even including Revelation. Now, uh, I believe I understand it a lot better. I definitely understand it a lot better than I used to. Um, so Psalm chapter 82, if people want to read it, it's only eight verses. So it's a quick read. God sits among the gods uh, and he judges the gods based on their treatment of their human subjects. Now, this is fascinating, and I've had people write to me and say, these are men. God's talking about a council of men. Well, verse 6 says, God says to them, I have said, ye are gods, but you will die like men, and I will cast you to the earth like one of the princes. So to sit here and say that these are men is just to blatantly ignore what Scripture says in Psalm chapter 82, verse 6. It's um, basically so telling Hebrews that they don't know what their own language means. Right. And what yeah. are we talking about when we're talking about these gods uh, judging people on the earth? Well, uh, we're separating this from the antediluvian watchers who were cast in the prison. Uh, we are now into the post-diluvian giants and the post-diluvian watchers. And this leads us to Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 7, 8, and 9. So in Deuteronomy 32, the Tower of Babel has happened. God splits the world into 70 nations. That's Deuteronomy 32, 8. And he numbers it according to the number of the children of Israel, which is 70. Verse 9, God chooses Jacob as the law of his inheritance. This is the portion of scripture where God chooses Israel as his chosen people. Well, what's going on here? According to the Greek Septuagint, God gives the nations according to the angelos theos, which are the angels of God. According to Dead Sea Scrolls, God gives the nations to the same Beneha Elohim, which we see in Genesis chapter 6, the angels. Uh, and so what I believe happens it seems that the earth and history is full as a cycle of God giving the earth to humans, humans messing it up, angels taking over, and God destroying it and giving it back to humans. Um, possibly in the before Genesis that Tom Horn wrote, there was an angelic realm possibly before our creation. We're not really going to get into that at the moment. Uh, but then we see God gives it to Adam. Adam messes up. And five generations after Adam, in the days of Jared, the watchers descend and the angels take over. God cleanses it with a flood. He gives the earth back to mankind. Nimrod screws it up uh, and, and, and does all kinds of things with Babylon and the Tower of Babylon, becomes a god. Uh, and so God uh, gives it to the angels, I believe, in Deuteronomy 32.8. So we see these uh, synonymous things in mythologies. 
Um, and that's one of the things I like to talk about. In fact, the book I'm writing now is Angels Eternal, but my next book, my fifth book, uh, I intend for it to be Mythologies Decoded, and I'm going to talk about the mythologies a lot more. Um, but one of the things I like to say on Marginal Mysteries is there's a whole lot more truth to our mythologies than a lot of people like to admit. Um, so, for instance, Psalm chapter 82, we find that in the story of Atlantis. Um, the God, God sits among the gods and he judges them based on their treatment of human subjects. The very first thing uh, in the story of Atlantis that Plato records is there was a day when the gods divided the earth among themselves. That's Deuteronomy 32 8. And then there's a pillar of laws in the middle of Atlantis where the gods come every few years to judge each other based on how they're treating their subjects. So hmm. we see things in mythology that point to scripture. We don't look at scripture through the lens of mythology. We look at mythology in the world and history through the lenses of the Bible. Um, and so the uh, the Greek gods, uh, they have their war, the Titanomachy between the Titans and the Olympians. Uh, after that, the gods divide the world among themselves, Zeus, Hades. Um, so we see a lot of things mirroring in scripture. Um, and if I can keep going, I know I'm saying a lot. No, the, go ahead. When we're, talk, when we're talking about the fallen angels after the flood, after the judgment in the book of Enoch, uh, we're talking about Deuteronomy 32, 8, where 70 angels they could have been fallen at that time. Uh, they could have been a mix. They could have all been good angels at that time. But they were put over the nations. Uh, and the question I get asked the most on Marginal Mysteries is how did the giants come back after the flood? Well, if God puts angels in human form over nations after the Tower of Babel, they're going to take human women as wives, and they're going to have giant offspring again. Um, I believe that the antediluvian earth, that humans, animals, that pretty much everything was twice the size of what they are today. Um, all the animal uh, fossil records show that animals are generally twice as big in the uh, in the Christian view, the antediluvian world. So it's reasonable to understand that Noah and Adam and Enoch were probably 12 feet tall, uh, which would be giants to us. But I think the giants in the antediluvian world were probably 20, 25 feet tall. Well, after the flood, mankind gets smaller uh, because of the lack of the firmament, which we talk about in the Earth as it was book right here. Mankind gets smaller. So when we talk about giants after the flood, they're still giants to us, Goliath. 12 feet tall, 11 feet tall, King Og of Bashan. Um, and so the uh, so the the princes of the air uh, that we read about are the princes of the nations. I think they're physical for 100, 200 to 500 years, but they eventually die. And so now they're spiritual beings, most of them evil, it appears. Um, and this is one of the three reasons that Jesus came to the earth. A lot of Christians don't know that Jesus came to the earth for three reasons. Salvation is the one I'm most thankful for. Jesus came to save us from our sins. Jesus also came to reverse the curse of Babel and defeat the princes of the powers of the air. That is uh, Michael Heiser's uh, book, uh, Reversing Hormon. Uh, that's the theme. Um, so uh, as far as reversing the curse of Babel, uh, after Babel, God divides the world into 70 languages. Well, what happens after Jesus rise, uh, resurrects from the dead? He sends 70 disciples out into the world, and when they speak, everyone hears in their own language. So Jesus reversed the curse of Babel. And then the third thing that Jesus came to do was to defeat the princes of the power of the air. Now, there is backup in scripture for the idea of there being uh, angels put over nations. Daniel chapter 10, uh, right. likely Gabriel the archangel takes him 21 days to come to uh, Daniel to answer his prayer. He says, I'm sorry, I, it took me a long time because I was delayed by the prince of Persia. He was an evil spiritual prince set over Persia. And Dan, or Gabriel says, I, I've got to go soon because the prince of Greece is coming too. So we see right there in Daniel chapter 10, two, na uh, two princes over the nations that are spiritual evil entities. Daniel chapter 12 says Michael is the prince of Israel. Um, so scripture does back up this idea of the gods, angels uh, ruling the nations. Um, we could go f uh, everywhere on this. My book I'm currently writing is Angels Eternal, where I'm talking about the angelic realm, um, the before Genesis theory. UFOs, which I do believe are demonic. Um, let's separate one more thing before I kick it back to you. When we talk about angels and demons and fallen angels, people need to understand that we don't just war against demons. There are two levels, at least, of evil spiritual entities. Fallen angels, which are very powerful. They're mentioned throughout scripture, Satan, Lucifer, Baal, uh, Abaddon. Um, there's a difference between them, which are fallen angels, and their offspring, the Nephilim spirits, which are the demons. Now, that theory comes from the book of Enoch. Scripture does not say that uh, the demons on the earth are the spirits of Nephilim, but Enoch does. That when the giants died, there was no place in heaven for their spirits, no place. So they kind of had to stay on the earth until the day of judgment. Enoch does say that. Now, the book of James, I believe it is, in the New Testament does say 
that devils and spirits are not the same thing. Uh, so scripture does back up this theory um, that we do have fallen angels and then we have demons, uh, two separate entities. And that was uh, clearly the understanding of the early church fathers. When you read anything that they re they've written about uh, the origin of demons, it's clear that they understood that they were the progeny of the uh, giants or the progeny of the angels who came to earth and commingled with women. Uh, angels who had been mm -hmm. placed here to oversee humanity, to oversee God's creation, and were tempted mm -hmm. by women and uh, gave into it. Um, this was uh, the default understanding of the early church. Um, the, the, something I, I find interesting, that Psalm 82 uh, uh, scene in heaven, which is like a courtroom scene where God comes into the, uh, in the midst of the gods and passes judgment and basically pa it declares a death sentence on them. Uh, this clearly would be the group that is not yet or that was not thrown into the abyss. That's the, uh, the, the antediluvian uh, fallen angels, the watchers. Um, when do you think that Psalm 82 courtroom scene might have taken place? Thanks for the difficult question. It's hard to tell <laughs> uh, with a number of the things. I was just writing today uh, in my Angels Eternals book about the uh, before Genesis theory and Psalm chapter 18 talks about um, the destruction of the earth. And I'm trying to put that puzzle in my head. Is this talking about revelation? Is this something that literally happened? Or are we talking about the earth before the seven days of creation? It's, it's, it's a hard question to answer. Um, yeah. But Bible I, doesn't in tell this, us. It's in this clear. right, in this evidence, I would say it's uh, likely synonymous with the story of Atlantis, the uh, Greek mythology, and that we're talking about the 70 angels, between 70 and 72 angels put over the nations uh, in Deuteronomy 32. Um, I just mentioned the number 70 to 72. There's different translations. I think the Greek right. Septuagint is a little bit different than the Masoretic. So it's between 70 and 72. You know, uh, is it 70 angels plus God choosing Israel? Does that make it 71? So, you know, the number is between 70 and 72. But what we see, my last book I just finished was Secret Societies. Um, and the secret societies are rooted in the knowledge of the watchers. Um, I'm bringing that back to the number 72, uh, the apotheosis of Washington. Man, I'm trying to think where to start this. Um, secret societies, let me give you the, the quick overview of the entire book. What we say is that uh, secret societies originated with the knowledge of the watchers. Uh, Genesis chapter 4 talks about Lamech and his sons. Ancient writings talk about the knowledge that Lamech's sons had. Tubal Cain was an artificer of metal. Uh, he mixed metals. Um, that's you know the technology that mankind possessed before the flood, I think, was vast. Um, we won't get into that too much. But basically, the sons of Lamech knew that God was going to destroy the earth with fire or water. They weren't sure which. So they carved the knowledge of the watchers, the forbidden knowledge, onto two different pillars, one to survive water, one to survive fire, and uh, to survive the flood. Well, what happens is, is who becomes Hermes, the Greek god, he finds one of the pillars. And in the three Arabic legends that write about this, it's called the Emerald Tablet. It's one one tablet. But many other cultures talk about two pillars. Some say that the pyramids were built to house this knowledge. Um, different cultures have different things. But basically, the knowledge of the watchers, the Greek god Hermes finds that knowledge. He shares it with Nimrod. That enables Nimrod to build the seven sacred sciences, uses geometry to build his ziggurats and his pyramids and his mighty Babylon and possibly the Tower of Babel. Scripture doesn't say that. Um, and then uh, this knowledge uh, is trying to ascend humanity, evolve humanity. And we're talking about the end times now in the Revelation. The secret societies and the fallen princes of the air who are in control of most of them are trying to enlighten mankind, evolve us into gods ourselves. What did Satan, excuse me, what did the serpent tell Eve in the garden? If you but take this fruit, you will become as God. That is the lie of the secret societies. That is the lie of these fallen angels. They want us to think that we are going to become gods ourselves. They're also trying to push a final battle against the creator, uh, and they're going to win. Excuse me, not win. That's not the right word. They're going to get their battle with the creator. It's called the Battle of Armageddon. They will not win that battle. Uh, mm -hmm. So the secret societies will ultimately be successful. Um, but uh, we got into that. We we're talking about the knowledge of the watchers, but. It's a fascinating topic, and uh, that was my latest book, Secret Societies. To, oh, we were talking about the number 70 and 72. Uh, the right. Apotheosis of Washington. Uh, let's talk about the schism in, in Freemasonry really quick at the founding of our country. There was a schism in Freemasonry. The Illuminati was created in 1776, and as a new, a new creation, they had to get members. So they infiltrated Freemason lodges and took Freemason members into the Illuminati. And so you had a schism in Freemasonry. The Freemasonry that believed in the God of the Bible, Solomon as their first excellent grandmaster. And then you had the Illuminati Enlightenment side of Freemasonry, 
represented by Benjamin Franklin, uh, who believed that Nimrod was their very first grandmaster. So you got George Washington representing the godly, the, uh, uh, good God of the Bible, Freemasonry, and Benjamin Franklin. Well, after George Washington dies, a man from the Vatican, a painter for the Vatican, paints the apotheosis of Washington under the Capitol ceiling of the United States Capitol building, still there today. It's called the Apotheosis of Washington. It's a painting of George Washington sitting among the Roman gods. It's George Washington becoming a god himself. So it was the, the Illuminati side of the Freemasonry sticking it to the George Washington side by painting George Washington doing that. But you'll see 72 stars around that painting. In the unfinished pyramid on the back of the United States dollar bill, you'll see 72 uh, stones in the unfinished pyramid. Uh, so that number 70, uh, 72 uh, got us into a long conversation about the secret societies, but uh, it's just fascinating stuff. So much symbolism in it. Well, yeah, it is. And I, I wrote extensively about it in my book, The Second Coming of Saturn, and, and took it uh, you know, mm. further. I know Tom Orn has written about it. I've in, got that uh, book. Um, Zenith, uh, Zenith 2016, um, uh, Polyon Rising 2012. Um, so we are, uh, I think, all triangulating on the same, uh, the same uh, um, source. Uh, Mac, the, the Mac same Dominic reasons. is another gentleman who's triangulating on that. Yeah, yeah, the, the same basic uh, um, goals for for that uh, painting. It, it represents something that I think George Washington would have found uh, absolutely abhorrent and uh, in opposition to what he believed. Um, the uh, yeah, we could do an entire program just on uh, what that represents <laughs> and what the, what they were hoping to accomplish with that. I mean, Tom Horn's uh, Apollyon Rising and Zenith 2016, uh, basically interpreting it as uh, a, a way of trying to engender the spirit of Antichrist. I think it's about bringing back the Apollyon, the destroyer. Um, but um, uh, it, it is very interesting that the United States Capitol is named the Capitol because that was the name of the Temple of Jupiter in Rome. And... Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Jupiter, Zeus, Baal, identified by Jesus in Matthew 12 as uh, Satan. So, um, mm -hmm. yeah, uh, Satan very famously or infamously offered all the kingdoms of the world to Jesus and said they were his to give, and Jesus did not contradict him. So uh, mm -hmm. God God bless men like you and uh, uh, your your friends for, for being willing to get into politics because it is not a business that uh, uh, I think is it, – it's, it's a blood sport and difficult for Christians to maintain the uh, – uh, their 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 walk in that uh, in that line of work. Um, sure. So so let, let's uh, in, in the last uh, ten or fifteen minutes here talk about this uh, mysteries of the Bible verse conference. Mm. First of all, the, the 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 title and the the artwork for the promotional poster I think Thank is you. brilliant. Mysteries of Thank the you. Bible verse. Bi okay, Bible verses. Yeah, we heard it, but the Bible verse as opposed to the universe or multiverse. Um, who came up with this? Because he deserves he or she deserves props. The, the secret ingredient in coming up with that name is a steak. Uh, myself and Matthew Hill sitting over a steak. We were speaking in uh, Kansas City last year. We uh -huh. were uh, Wichita. We were somewhere last year speaking. We were eating steak, and uh, we were wanting to come up with a name. And so uh, if you are familiar, I'm, I'm 45. So Masters of the Universe to He-Man sure, figures, sure. That's, that was our, our inspiration. The logo is, is – uh, it took me two days to do that logo. I have a, a, one of my minors is graphic design, so I do – uh, the, the design for all that. The art is AI art. Um, we generate mm -hmm. a lot of AI art and then um, it takes a lot of Photoshop work. The, the poster for Mysteries of the Bible Verse is probably 35 hours worth of Photoshop work on top of all the AI art. So I don't doubt it. I know that I know that the logo, the wording, just the wording took me 16 hours to do. But anyway, um, so yes, we use AI art uh, for, for my videos and stuff and a lot of Photoshop with that. And so the Mysteries of the Bible Verse, um, Southwest Radio Ministries has been around for 91 years. I've been doing conferences with them for three years now. I know they've been doing conferences a lot longer than that. Uh, but now that I'm on board, uh, Matthew and I decided that we're going to do a Mysteries of the Bible Verse conference. And so this will be the first one, Cincinnati, Ohio, June 7th and 8th. Uh, if folks want to go get tickets, uh, you can do so at swrc.com, southwestradiochurch.com, um, or marginalmysteries.com will take you right to it. And uh, get your tickets. It's Cincinnati, June seventh and eighth. Uh, for speakers, uh, yourself, uh, Mr. Gilbert, you are uh, uh, being our prime speaker for Saturday. Uh, Rudy Landa mm -hmm. is our prime speaker for Friday night. Uh, we've got. Let's see. I don't want to leave anybody out. Let me count my fingers. We got uh, you two, myself, Mac Dominic, Greg Patton, uh, who has spent forty years in helping people with demons and demon possession. Uh, his newest book is uh, Invisible War on the Saints. 
Uh, we've got Josh Davis, and we've got Michael, Pastor Michael Hoggard, uh, the UFO pastor. He talks about uh, the his, see this time he's talking about uh, spiritual sightings and UFOs of the spirit realm. I think so. Um, that is my seven speakers. Yep, we got seven there. So um, you know it's gonna it's gonna be a good time, and I hope folks uh, hope folk, hope to point folks to the Lord uh, at the mysteries of the Bible verse and. Uh, intend to do it every year as long as God tarries. Well, amen to that. Um, the, the thing that we found so exciting in, in what Sharon and I have been doing over the last, uh, well, 25 years really, but uh, especially since coming here to the Ozarks nine years ago, is uh, being able to dive into Scripture and really understand that the, 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 the war chronicle that is the Bible mm -hmm. is, is like... Uh, Lord of the Rings on steroids. I mean, <laughs> yeah. it, it, I mean, you've got everything there that that a fiction author could possibly need. You've got, uh, you know, angels and demons and wizards and monsters and giants and heroes and, in some cases, just average people, flawed, failing humans who mm -hmm. rise to the occasion through the power of the Holy Spirit. And uh, this this is the kind of thing that Tolkien tried to communicate through his fiction, that C.S. Lewis tried to communicate, and uh, here we are when you dig into the word and you realize that hidden behind the Hebrew and the Greek and the Aramaic uh, and sometimes loan words from Egyptian and Assyrian and so forth, that uh, there's a lot more in there. It's a lot more supernatural than most of us have been taught. Yeah, it absolutely is. And, and it's fascinating. You know, the witch of Endor, the story of you try to glean all these things from Scripture because we as Christians, we have an advantage over uh, secular archaeologists, secular folks because we have the bible which is true and so if we see something in the bible we can take that as a foundation uh, to launch ourselves and say okay this is what it's talking about we look at the world through the lenses of the bible the witch of endor you know solomon it's not some evil spirit it's actually excuse me samuel it's actually samuel that comes up and speaks uh, to king saul um, there are two uh, sons of god who escort uh, Samuel uh, across the great gulf that is fixed, it appears is what it's talking about. So when you read these things, it's like, wow, man. I mean, that is really stuff that happened. Um, and, it, and it's just fascinating to study. And uh, boy, I'll tell you, if you want to get a kid excited about uh, scripture, just uh, point him to uh, that uh, chapter in Job. And I'm trying to find it real quick here on my Bible app, and I'm not uh, seeing where <laughs> there it is. Uh, Job chapter, is it 41? Yeah. That's when, Leviathan. Uh, he just he describes Leviathan. Um, yep. Most Bible teachers will say, yeah, it's a crocodile or it's it's a hippo or something. Uh, like, I, I'm sorry, one that right breathes there fire? Is. Yeah, there you go. In Isaiah and, 14, I believe it is, he has multiple heads, which is why we... 20, uh, 27, crush the okay. heads of Leviathan. Yeah. yeah. And uh, which, which follows the uh, references in Isaiah 26 about uh, other lords have ruled over us, but uh, your name alone we bring to remembrance. They are mm -hmm. dead. They will not live. They are Rephaim. They will not arise. Um, mm -hmm. So, yeah, this is a long war. And when you start digging into the word, you realize that we've been aligned against it, these uh, angels and giants, to borrow the title of Rudy Lane. It answers, it answers questions. Well, uh, I know we're getting a little short on time. It answers questions, and I'll, I'll point out one of the most important ones. As a kid, I always wondered why God ch told Joshua and Moses, but told Joshua to not just conquer people, but also kill the women, the children, and the animals, to utterly wipe them out. But after I learned about the bloodlines of the giants, I go back and I read it as an adult, and I see every instance where God tells Joshua and Moses to utterly wipe them out. They're a race of Rephaim, Anakim, Zimims. They're a race of giants, and it makes sense. Yeah, they totally sold out to the uh, fallen realm. Uh, once again, where do people find out more information about uh, not just the, the conference? Obviously, we want them to go to the uh, uh, website and, and uh, register early for the conference uh, coming to Cincinnati June 7th and 8th. But also, where do they follow your work? Marginalmysteries.com. Marginalmysteries.com. Um, on there, we have links to all the social media. We got YouTube videos that we put out on these topics and uh you know facebook instagram rumble we got uh, most of the major ones on there but if you go to the website you'll find the link to all the social media marginalmysteries.com you can sign up for the website you can purchase uh, my books you can purchase t-shirts uh different things um, noah was a conspiracy theorist different things uh so marginalmysteries.com that is uh <laughs> boy that is a cool website <laughs> thank you man yeah yeah and love the logo too well you, you've got a gift brother and uh, we are honored to uh 
join you. Uh, we haven't seen Mike Hoggard in a long time. He, even though he's mm-hmm. here in our home state of Missouri, looking forward to uh, seeing him again. Rudy Landa, who's become a good friend, and uh, the other speakers that you've lined up. Looking very much forward to uh, making some new friends and some new um, uh, some new uh, friends at this uh, this conference, and especially in Cincinnati, which which is a city that I, I don't get to very often, but it's it's kind of um, holds a special place in, in our family history because my ancestors were on the first boatload of settlers that landed at Cincinnati back in 1788. So, um, mm-hmm. wow. yeah. So for me, this is kind of, kind of a neat thing. Uh, I don't think we'll get over to the other side of the river to see the rock there that they put as a memorial stone a hundred years after they landed, but still really? uh, knowing that uh, we're going back kind of the land of our ancestors, uh, June 7th and 8th, yeah. the uh, mysteries of the Bible verse conference, Micah Van Hus, one of the featured speakers there, go to his website, marginalmysteries.com. Micah, I look forward to seeing you there and meeting you in person. Derek, I, I appreciate you having me and I really look forward to meeting you and speaking with you at the mysteries of the Bible verse and, uh, Wish your audience the best. In five, four, three, two. Links in the notes below this program. Do check it out. You'll find the itinerary for the Southwest Radio Ministries Mysteries of the Bible Verse Conference coming to Cincinnati June seventh and eighth. There at that link. Um, some fascinating topics here with the other speakers. Uh, Micah Van Hus, of course, will be one of the speakers at the conference, The Earth As It Was and Secret Societies. Interesting stuff there. Michael Hoggard, uh, pastor of Bethel Church in Festus. Haven't seen Mike in many years, but uh, we keep up with him on social media. And I know that he tackles a lot of difficult topics. He'll be talking about spirit realm UFOs and sightings of the spirit realm. Um, Greg Patton at War With Demons. Uh, Rudy Landa, Nephilim, Why They Matter Today, and uh, Josh Davis, an AI extinction level event is imminent. So if you're wondering about some of these strange topics that uh, get discussed usually on those uh, cable channels or on YouTube channels that uh, are not Christian in nature, hey, the Bible does have answers for these. That's really why we do what we do, and we hope you'll join us in Cincinnati June 7th and 8th, swrc.com for more information, or just follow the link in the notes below. Coming up, President Biden says he didn't know he was declaring Easter Sunday, Resurrection Sunday, to be the Transgender Day of Visibility. That means just one of two things. Bless his pointy little head. I'll talk about that straight ahead. And still time for you to join our solidarity mission to Israel next month. Tales straight ahead as a view from the bunker continues. Summer reading season is just around the corner. We want to help you get ready. You can buy fiction. You can buy nonfiction through the Gilbert House store. Whichever you want, all of our books are 40% off, 40%. That includes all eight novels of the Red Wing Mm -hmm. Saga. Book nine is coming, probably early summer. My two novels, and then of course all of our nonfiction stuff, Mm -hmm. including our most recent books, Giants, Gods, and Dragons, The Second Coming of Saturn, and Veneration, a deep dive into the cult of the Nephilim. April and May, you get 62 days, no, 61. April only has 30. (laughs) Regardless, through the end of May, 40% off on all of our books at the Gilbert House store. Available only online. Go to gilberthouse.org slash store. You'll find all the prices slashed on our books. 40% off gilberthouse.org slash store. And thank you for your prayers and support. Driving the internet to think. This is a view from the bunker online at vftb.net. That's our main website, but our web hub, our global base of operations is gilberthouse.org, gilberthouse.org. That's where you'll find everything that we do, including a link to our free mobile app. More on that in just a second. Uh, Social media, X, formerly Twitter, at viewfrombunker or at Derek Gilbert. And remember, Derek is spelled D-E-R-E-K. Use as few letters as you can get away with. Uh, on Facebook, View From The Bunker is the page, and you'll also find us on Truth Social. Gab me, we get her at Derek P. Gilbert, Derek P. Gilbert. YouTube, youtube.com slash at Gilbert House. Once you subscribe, click that bell to trigger notifications. Then please take a moment and download our free mobile app. 
because that guarantees we never get canceled. At some point on this program, without intending to, I will probably say something in violation of community standards. That's just the nature of the world in which we live. So guarantee we never get canceled because it's our app. We won't be canceled from our app. The benefit is not only do you get this program, you get our weekly broadcast program, Unraveling Revelation, plus our two podcasts, PID Radio, and our Bible study podcast, The Gilbert House Fellowship. We've been doing this since 2005, and we're putting a lot of those archives there on the app as well. We've got Roku and Apple TV uh, versions, and the Fire TV version of the app is now in review. So that should soon be available. If you've got a Fire TV, the app is coming. It will be available soon. Um, But uh, meanwhile, you can get it for your smartphone or tablet, iOS, Android, Amazon, Kindle Fire, phone or tablet. And it brings not only all of our content to you, but uh, a Bible app with multiple translations, audio Bible, no less, and uh, the communities function. have not been as active recently there as, um, as I intend it to be. Uh, and I know I see the notifications. It's a very active app, and we are really, really blessed by that because it's a way of connecting people who are like you, interested in some of the things that uh, maybe don't get discussed as often as we should, perhaps, or could be discussed in church settings. So uh, it is a way to gather and fellowship, to ask for prayer, to pray for one another, to encourage, exhort, instruct, share other learning resources. We're fine with that. You can do all of that inside the app, and because it's offline, you know the bots that troll the web looking for troublemakers won't stumble across it. So you'll find that at gilberthouse.org slash app. There's also a link at vftv.net. You'll find that in the top menu bar. Click the link, download the app that's right for your device, and join in the conversations. Should be able to get back on the app more frequently going forward because we're just about ready to turn in the manuscript for uh, The Gates of Hell, which I've been uh, working on like crazy. Turned it over to Sharon for final polish which is what will make it good, actually. And uh, then that will be off to the editor. Should be available fourth quarter this year from Defender Publishing. We're looking forward to uh, putting that out. Then I get back to video editing on our um, uh, Valley of the Shadow of Death video because we think we have identified the Valley of the Shadow of Death from Scripture. And uh, we will explain why we think it is where it is. And we are really, really thankful that we got to go to Israel last year because. Um, while we pray we will be in Israel next month and again next spring, that really depends on things that are outside our control. So uh, we will talk more about our solidarity mission going forward, but uh, last spring we had the opportunity to spend several days before the tour with skilled tour guides and an archaeologist who's done the most recent peer-reviewed research at Gilgal Rephaim and the Serpent Mound of Bashan. And so you'll see that in the forthcoming video that we will, we are planning to release. You know what they say about the best laid plans. Uh, we are planning to release fourth quarter alongside the Gates of Hell. So the Gates of Hell book and the Valley of the Shadow of Death DVD or streaming video will uh, probably do both. That uh, should be available fourth quarter of this year. So um, in the news, of course, <laughs> this is one week following Resurrection Sunday, and of course you probably know by now that on Good Friday. President Biden saw fit to issue an official proclamation declaring March 31st to be the Transgender Day of Visibility. Now, this is a thing that's been going on for 15 years. It's been uh, March 31st every year since its first declaration back in 2009. So it was not originally intentionally picked to fall on the most sacred holy day on the uh, annual Christian calendar, although Picking it in March or April, it was bound to fall on that day sooner or later since Easter Sunday, according to the way it's calculated by the church here in the West. I mean, yeah, come on. We, it, let's be honest, it should coincide with the Passover, but it doesn't. The early church designated what it's the first Sunday after the first full moon after the spring equinox. I think that's the formula. Anyway, this year it was kind of early, so March 31st, and it just happened to coincide with this particular date. Now, President Biden has um, issued that official proclamation in previous years, and nobody was like, you know, okay, it was like, you know, okay, big deal. Uh, there are, to be honest, about 140 days I've seen. I've not gone through the calendar and counted myself, so I'm depending on other people's research being accurate, but about 140 days on the calendar that um, are 
recognizing the LGBTQIA plus movement in one form or another. Okay. Fine. President Biden didn't need to declare this year that, because somebody inside the White House surely looked at a calendar and said, hmm, this might get some pushback from Christians who take their faith seriously. Not all of them vote Republican. There might be some who vote Democrat who might be offended by this in the, say, African-American or Latino communities. A lot of people, a lot of churchgoers in those communities, and uh, President Biden's poll numbers have been sliding in those communities. And uh, last polling I saw showed that in six out of seven battleground states, Biden is trailing Donald Trump in a hypothetical matchup. You would think that President Biden would not want to antagonize the millions of American Christians who surely outnumber the small percentage who identify as other than their birth gender. But he didn't, or somebody in the White House didn't. You see, this this is an incident that really convinces me that President Biden doesn't really set the agenda inside the White House. There have been little clues here and there, and he kind of laughs it off. And the media, corporate media, of course, running cover for him, laughs it off too. Well, (laughs) he was only joking about only doing what he's told and only calling on the reporters they tell him to call on and, you know, having to ask permission to do this or that. He didn't really mean that. So. Okay. Well, anyway, when the inevitable pushback came, when people said, you know, it really is kind of offensive to... Cre-. Look, it's not that Christians, speaking for myself anyway, get worked up about, say, a dude who wants to wear a dress. Uh, okay, look, if you want to you believe you're a woman and live that way, that is your choice. I don't have a problem with a guy who wants to wear a dress. I have a problem with a guy who wants to talk children into changing their genders. And and you got to put that in air quotes because that's not really a thing. You cannot really change your gender. You are either an XX or an XY, except in a very, very small percentage of cases. You are, not everybody lives out, you know, what, it like, what it's like to be a man or a woman in the same way. But as a growing number of activists inside the LGB community are now saying, look, same-sex attraction is not the same thing as believing that you are the wrong gender. So there is some pushback coming from people who said, you know, this movement is the movement that is encouraging parents, school districts, even churches, to allow men in dress to read stories to very young children and to normalize this behavior. And this we have a problem with. Look, if you want to do this in the, as, as a consenting adult, that's fine. Don't care. Honestly, really don't. But to declare this day and this movement, on the day where Christians around the world celebrate the bodily resurrection of Jesus, which is really the most important thing in Christian doctrine. The bodily resurrection of Jesus is what really anchors the whole thing. That's why 1 Corinthians 15 is what it is. Paul issuing, first of all, an apologetic for the faith. Hey, there were hundreds of witnesses who saw this. He appeared first to Peter, then to James, then to the Twelve, then to 500 brothers at once, most of whom are still alive. If you don't believe me about the resurrection, send somebody to Jerusalem, you Corinthians, and ask around. Because that's what this is all about. It is the most important thing in the Christian calendar. And President Biden issues a proclamation saying, this is the transgender day of visibility. So Christians like, you know, you might have shown a little more respect to the tens of millions of Christians who take their faith seriously in this country. Now, here's the funny thing, except that it's not funny. (laughs) On Monday, when he was questioned about it, President Biden said, I didn't do that. 
And the reporter said, well, OK, Speaker Mike Johnson said that you did. The, just, and Biden doubled down and said, Speaker Johnson is thoroughly uninformed. Except that it's at WhiteHouse.gov. The proclamation is at WhiteHouse.gov. I, President Joseph R. Biden Jr., using the power vested in me by the Constitution, blah, 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 blah. It's right there, and it's on his Twitter feed, his X feed. Which means one of two things. Either President Biden doesn't know what his staff is doing in his name, or he is incapable of remembering what he did literally the day before. Now, you can even set aside this issue because when you take this issue to social media, there will be people who uh, then assume that you're raising the issue because you're a hater. And maybe there are some who do raise this issue because they just are really angry about the movement. And like I said, when it comes to adults who want to pretend that they're the other gender, okay, that's fine. You do you. Just don't do our kids and our grandkids. Let them grow up and then they can decide what they want to do. But setting the issue aside, the fact that the President of the United States is unaware of what is being done or cannot remember what has been done for more than 48 hours in his name, either unaware or unable to remember, should bother you regardless of where you fall on this issue. And I would say the same thing if it was Donald Trump in office, denying that he had done something that had just been publicized within the previous 48 hours. When the chief executive of your government has so loose a grasp on what is happening in his name, especially one that offends tens of millions of people unnecessarily, you got to wonder what the heck is going on. So I, I will say, as I've said publicly for several years now, Joe Biden should have been allowed to retire. The Democrats have propped him up for the last several years because they didn't have anyone else running in 2020 who was capable of drawing enough independent voters to beat Donald Trump. And I know we've, we've discussed the election. I'm not going to question it at this point. The bottom line is Biden was the best that they had. And so that's where we are. The Lord allowed it for his reasons. That's the thing we as Christians have to remember. What we've had since 2021 has been allowed by God for his reasons. Come quickly, Lord. And uh, to Mr. Biden and his handlers, bless their pointy little heads. We've talked about the... Uh, Talked about the mysteries of the Bible verse conference, and as you are watching this, the uh, Prophetic Signs in the Heavenlies conference is on in Dallas. In fact, by the time you see this, I will already have delivered my presentation on uh, the Ganymede Code. Rather than dealing with uh, the total eclipse of the sun on Monday, which is a pretty interesting sign in the Heavenlies, I'm going back to the Great Conjunction of 2020. You can still get video streaming and watch the presentation from Hear the Watchmen, hearthewatchmen.com. I'm going to talk about what happened on December 21st, the winter solstice of 2020, and what it portended, because I think it explains a lot of what we have endured since uh, 2021, uh, especially when you understand what astrologers think about this. Now, as Christians, we know that our fates are not determined by the movement of the planets in the heavens. But there are a lot of wealthy, powerful people who do think so and have planned their actions accordingly. So uh, that is something you can still take advantage of. Other, other uh, presentations by the likes of uh, Paul Begley, Colonel David Giamona, who will be a guest on this program in the, in the very near future. Pastor Casper McLeod, David Hevner, Dr. Kerry Mayday, who uh, became rather... Uh, infamous among the corporate media during the uh, lockdowns. Dave Hodges, Michael Boldea, Tuv Rose, John Moore, David Paxton, Doug Thornton, good friend of Timothy Alberino's. I uh, went with him on that expedition to Peru to deal with the levitating guys, entities, whatever. Uh, again, more information on the streaming video at hearthewatchmen.com. 
Com. In June, the 21st through the 23rd, Sharon and I will be featured at a small little gathering at the Finley River Ranch in Sparta, Missouri. This is with His Call Ministries. We'll be there for the weekend. We're calling the weekend the Gates of Hell. And we will be talking about said gates, seeing as how we've just completed the manuscript for a forthcoming book on that subject. What are they? Are, is it a physical? Are they physical portals? Mm, yeah, but uh, also no. So uh, if you're interested in more, you can find out more at hiscallministries.com, hiscallministries.com. The Go Therefore Conference coming up in July. We're really looking forward to this one as well. Um, This is at the Harvest Revival Center just outside Dayton, Brookville, Ohio, suburban Dayton. Uh, Dr. Michael Lake, L.A. Marzulli, Pastor Paul Begley, uh, Pastor Carl Gallup's Dr. Judd Burton will be there. And uh, we hope you will be as well. Streaming video available for this one as well. Uh, July 26th, 27th, Harvest Revival Center, Brookville, uh, just outside Dayton, Ohio. You can get more information and register today, either in person or streaming video at GoThereforeConference.com. That's GoThereforeConference.com. Now, next month, May 6th through 13th, we are still planning, still planning on going to Israel for our solidarity mission. This will be a one-week tour, a small, intimate gathering, a couple dozen people, maybe as few as a dozen. Um, We'll do it if there's a dozen people who go with us. We will go to uh, Jerusalem and see the holy sites that you want to see, the Temple Mount, the Mount of Olives. We will take you to what we believe are the historic locations of the crucifixion and the resurrection, the burial tomb of Jesus. We will also go to sites in the Negev, like the town of Sterot, that were attacked on October 7th. We planned a barbecue with IDF soldiers while we're down there. And then in Tel Aviv, we will visit Hostage Square, where vigil is still being kept for the remaining hostages in Gaza, and uh, see an exhibit based on the Nova Music Festival. And while we're there, we're also going to visit a site that we visited back in uh, 2018 called Gush Etzion. This was the site of a massacre during the 1948 War for Independence. It is essentially Israel's Alamo. Powerful. And really, it will really affect you. Well, we'll also see the uh, the Israel Museum there, which is a very powerful um, memorial of the Holocaust. And if you can come out of there with dry eyes, uh, then you're a better person than I am, a stronger person anyway. Um, you can find out more. There's still time to register and sign up at uh, gilberthouse.org slash travel. There's a short video there from uh, Aaron Lipkin, CEO of Lipkin Tours, wearing his IDF uniform. He has now just passed 100 days on active duty with the IDF since uh, the war began on October 7th. Um, Again, more information. uh, The full itinerary is there, and then there's a link to take you to the Lipkin Tours website, gilberthouse.org slash travel. And next spring, God willing, we will be back in the Holy Land for our full tour, along with our special guests, Doug Van Dorn, Dr. Judd Burton, and Timothy Alberino. This will be like a rolling conference through the Holy Land. Don't miss it. The dates, March, uh, let's see, what do we got here? Did I move? Did I update my, didn't update my notes. Um, Yes. Anyway, late March, early April. The information is correct at our website, so you can find it there, gilberthouse.org slash travel and uh, put in your reservation then. And if things change, Lipkin Tours will not hold you uh, it will not hold your money. Uh, they they understand that if uh, the schedule changes again due to circumstances beyond our control, um, that's just God's will, and they will refund your money. So uh, you will not be obligated. Put down a deposit, and if things change, you can't make the new dates. Then all will be all will be made well. So uh, that is what we've got coming up on the uh, schedule. Um, Oh, almost forgot. Valley City, North Dakota, the Pitchfork and Hoe Gathering again, uh, September 6th and 7th of 2024. The Eagles Club in Valley City, North Dakota. Looking forward. Had a a lot of fun with uh, that gathering last year, but uh, wisely, they have moved it to September when the odds of snow and ice are much less than in late October. So uh, we hope to see you there, and you can find out more at the Pitchfork and Hoe webpage, uh, or Facebook page, I should say. There's a link in our... uh, our calendar at gilberthouse.org. You can also find it in the calendar section at our app, gilberthouse.org slash app. Thank you for taking time out of your schedule to watch or listen today, wherever that may be. If you are listening via Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, which will soon be rolled into YouTube Music, by the way, 
I understand Google is giving up the separate podcasting thing and just rolling it into YouTube. Amazon Music, iHeartRadio, Spotify, Spreaker, Pandora, or wherever fine podcasts are sold, we thank you. And if you get a spare moment, give us a uh, give us a good review at one of those sites. Um, our announcer, the inimitable DC Good. And a few from the bunkers of production of Gilbert House Ministries, released on Creative Commons at Fusion Net for Net non-commercial 4.0 international license non-commercial no derivatives that is uh, we wrestle not against flesh and blood and good night Oliver wherever you are thank you for watching or listening I'm Derek Gilbert and this is a view from the bunker.